Thank you, Ben. Sometimes there's something uh, <clears throat> a little discouraging about being lieutenant governor. When I was a state senator, I spoke to uh, statewide farmers union audiences uh, three different times that I can remember. And now I've been relegated to the position of panel moderator. But uh, <clears throat> I won't take that as a demotion at all because uh, you wait and see. One of these years I'll do something significant enough to earn the honor of being a full-fledged convention speaker. And I'm looking forward to, to that day. Until that happens, though, I'm going to use just a couple of minutes of the panel's time here, and I don't think they'll mind, uh, to share a couple of things with you, to draw your attention, get everybody a chance to come in and be seated, and, uh, and to get our, all our attention and all our thoughts focused uh, in this direction. I've always been proud of the fact that I've been a member of the Farmers uh, Union now for almost 10 years, tried to be uh, active uh, in it. And I have never had a problem supporting Farmers Union legislative goals and programs. That's never been a problem to me the six years that I was in the legislature and was proud to speak up for some of those major things that, uh, that you uh, addressed yourselves to. <clears throat> I also believe that your state president, Ben Radcliffe, and your national president, Tony Deshant, are probably two of the outstanding agricultural spokesmen in the United States today. And I think that I, I believe that with all my heart. <clears throat> <clears throat> this past August, I had the opportunity of attending my first National Lieutenant Governor's Conference. And besides having a delightful time there, we had serious discussions on the issues facing this country. We talked about unemployment and inflation, energy, education, the bicentennial, tourism, and crime. And this went on for hours. And after a couple of days of that, I, I really couldn't contain myself any longer. And I got the floor and gave an extemporaneous speech on America's most discounted blessing, that being agriculture. And I challenged that group of 50 state legislative leaders uh, and uh, governmental leaders to, to do something, uh, not just pass a resolution, but to do something beyond that. And what I said must have had some impact, for the, the conference decided to set up a National Food and Agricultural Policy Committee and fund it. <clears throat> and uh, they did that. We, didn't, we don't have one now nationally at all. The National Governors Conference doesn't have one. The National Legislative Conference doesn't have one. But we have one. And the whole present erratic state of what's going on in agriculture in this country bothers me a great deal. And I think the group that brings the loose ends together and helps develop a national policy on agriculture is the is is committee that's going to get the, the attention. Uh, it seems to me that our whole mood right now in agriculture in this state, and we're going to talk about that, the panel members are going to, and nationally, is we're getting ourselves into a position where we'll have to depend on 60-cent hogs and 60-cent cattle and $5 wheat <clears throat> and $3 corn to keep going. We're spending twice as much for land as the land is worth, and if we have any kind of reversal at all, there's going to be a lot of us so far out in the limb that we're not going to be able to recover from it. And somebody's got to get a handle on it. Certainly, this present uh, administration isn't, in, in my view. Well, this national committee that's been selected, I was selected vice chairman of it. We're going to meet in Ohio in December, <clears throat> along with a pretty heavyweight national group. And you're going to hear a lot uh, about it. And I just thought I'd mention it here so you can follow our activities in the press. I think today that we're spending some time, that the fact that we are spending some time listening to legislators and discussing issues with them is uh, not only appropriate, but a very, very commendable thing on the part of this uh, uh, conference, part of this convention. Uh, I want to introduce these gentlemen to you. I know them all personally and well. I've worked with every one of them over the years in the legislature, and we have a good group here. I'll start with uh, Henry Poppin, just to introduce him on my uh, far right. He's from Kingsbury County. He's a farmer, and he's been in the Senate for, I think, about 10 years. <clears throat> if you're from that county and want to cheer him on, that's all right. Uh, yeah, we have, some. we have some from that neck of the woods. <clears throat> Philip Testerman from Hand County started out in the House, and now he got promoted, of course, to the Senate. <clears throat> uh, Henry is a Republican and Phil is a Democrat, but their voting records on farm-related issues are almost uh, identical. 
Representative Les Clevin, he's in the middle, this little fellow here in the middle, wave your hand, Les, is a radio broadcaster uh, from Sturgis, and he has attracted a lot of attention. I think that the reason he's attracted a lot of attention is not just because he's very fluid of speech, but because he really has a mind of his own. And I think he's a real friend of the little guy, and I know that you'll enjoy Les uh, today. Representative Lars Herseth uh, in the brown suit there from uh, Brown County. <clears throat> and while, uh, while Lars has a well-known name and comes from a leading family in this state, he's certainly making a mark in his own right and uh, is doing a great job. Uh, Bob Weber, right here on my immediate left, is from a farmer from Grant County, the large municipality of, uh, of uh, Strandburg, and I'm sure you've all been to Strandburg. Uh, I often kid Bob about his uh, political unreliability because sometimes I think uh, he'd make a good Democrat and he says, not yet, not yet. <clears throat> but uh, you'll, you'll enjoy uh, Bob, a friendly person to be sure. Jim Endries, your program said, was supposed to be here this morning. He had a, uh, a small accident this morning where he injured his back uh, to the point of discomfort that he couldn't be here. But Andy Weiss, Representative Andy Weiss, has been in the legislature a long time, a successful farmer from Moody, uh, has, is uh, taking his place today, and he'll do a good job for you, and Andy knows a lot about taxes and a lot about everything. <coughs> <coughs> so I think the way we're going to spend this next uh, hour and a half, or as long as you want to spend, or as little time as you want to spend, would be, uh, would be to do it this way. To give each of these uh, people, each of these legislators, about five minutes to talk to you about an issue that is particularly on their mind as it relates to, not directly to agricultural maybe, but at least to the quality of life in rural areas. And that means that uh, some of them, I think Phil Testerman is going to talk about uh, health care in rural areas, maybe get into the physician extender program. I know some of you are interested in that. Uh, Lars Herseth wants to touch upon the <clears throat> Oahe referendum that undoubtedly the legislature is going to be involved in that issue very heavily. Bob Weber uh, is going to talk about uh, farm organizations and, and the potential for farm unity uh, in these times. Uh, Henry Poppin, Senator Poppin, wants to talk about uh, pump priming, the role of the state in agricultural economic development, and get into the economic uh, bills a little bit. Uh, Les Clevin is uh, very much involved now in the minimum foundation study and wants to talk about education and naturally then we'll get into its financing. And Andy Weiss will get into uh, tax proposals uh, for 1976. I don't know if he's going to be as, op uh, as optimistic as Ben Radcliffe was yesterday in a TV shot that I saw last night on the news or not, but that's, that's up to him. Now, we could spend hours, and we do in the legislature and the interim, on any one of these subjects. We could spend hours and hours on them, and we don't have hours and hours. So we're going to try and move along. After these people have addressed the subjects that uh, they uh, have seen fit to address, we're going to take questions from the audience. They have to be written. We'll have pages come and collect them. We'll screen them so we don't have a lot of the same questions on the same issue. And then we'll have a question addressed to a specific legislator, his reaction. If there's another reaction here on the panel, we'll take that. If there are any further reactions from the floor, we'll do that. Now, my job is to keep this within a time frame that makes some sense. We're not going to spend, for example, a whole hour on rural health care, although we could. We're going to move it along, so if I cut you off, if I change the subject, which I'll have to do, I'm sure, don't take it personally. It's just that we want to cover more ground. So we're going to uh, get along here, and I'm sure we're going to have a great time. I hope that you're attentive. Ask uh, piercing questions and hope uh, not for a vague answer, because these aren't just plain old politicians. They're farmer politicians, and they'll tell you uh, the way it is. There's a lot of difference, you know, between the city guys. No, no, no offense, Les, because Les will tell you the way it is, too. He, above all, probably will tell you the way it is. So Senator Testerman, we'll let you start out, and he wants to talk about uh, health care in the rural areas. <coughs> Philip. Mr. President, you know, I'm used to calling Harvey Mr. President. We ran together, him for the Senate and myself for the House one time, and then when I got in the Senate, I suddenly found that I had to call him Mr. President. I think it'd be kind of nice in about three years if I'd call him Gov, but I don't know whether he's going to do that or not. <laughs> 
to President Ben Radcliffe and to the fellow legislators here and to my many friends in Farmers Union, I could probably talk this morning, as Harvey said, on numerous things. I think we could go on antiquated tax structure in South Dakota, or I serve on the South Dakota Indian Commission. I could say, well, we have 5% of the Indian people in South Dakota, yet 30% of them are inmates in the state penitentiary. Or I could talk about our budget being small in the ag department, and yet it's our number one industry. But I've chosen instead to talk on rural health care this morning just for a few minutes. I was over to the breakfast this morning, and I'm sure some of you were there. And Ruth Gavell, I believe this is the right pronunciation, touched on this just a little bit. I think that the real reason that I've chosen this for a topic this morning is because I'm rural. I think I'm as rural as anyone on this panel. We have about 18 counties in South Dakota with no doctors, and two of these counties join the county that I live in. I live 21 miles from the nearest town, which incidentally doesn't have a doctor. I still have a rural school. My township has three different phone exchanges in it. It has three different mailing addresses. I have neighbors that live a mile from me that I call long distance on the phone. So I feel I'm rural. I guess I could move to town, but you know we can't all live in the city. And in real, really I enjoy rural living. I do see some disadvantages from it in this respect that I was telling you about and holds true in our health care too. I want to give you just a few facts this morning in relationship to our problems in rural health care. Good morning. I mentioned before that we have about 18 counties in South Dakota that have no doctors. We have 50 of our 67 counties that have fewer than one physician for every 1,500 population. We rank 50th, South Dakota ranks 50th in this respect. We have some South Dakotans that live about 150 miles from a physician. We have 50,000 people in South Dakota that live at least 50 miles from a physician. We have about 150,000 people in South Dakota that live that far from a hospital. We have 21 counties with no licensed hospital. We have 23 counties with no nursing homes. We only have six counties out of the 67, and they're all pretty much in eastern South Dakota, that have any intensive care facilities. We only have 10 counties that enjoy the presence of mental health centers. And more than 20 counties have no public health nursing service. Only 18 counties out of the total 67 have home health agencies. And if possible, things could be worse, I suppose. As I mentioned before, South Dakota ranks 50th in number of doctors to patients or people. We have one doctor in South Dakota for about every 1,341 people. This is a gloomy picture, and we have done a few things, which I will mention that, that have probably helped to alleviate some of this, but we must realize in the legislature and the citizens of the state, if we are to provide services and to correct any given situation, it takes time and it takes money. And as we demand more services, it's inevitable that taxes have to be increased to pay the bill. I'm going to give you a little personal experience. I had the misfortune a few years ago to lose a good friend while trying to get to a local hospital. But without the things in an ordinary car to sustain life in an emergency, the person was lost. And I'm convinced that with some of the services that we have added today, in just the past couple of years, this person could very well be alive today and sitting in this audience. One of the services that I refer, refer to is our ambulance service. Some of the changes we've made in that in the past just two or three years. It's changed a great deal. 
And the reason for this is uh, our isolation of our people from good services in South Dakota, and because of the low density of our population, we, we got involved in emergency health services. We used some federal monies and some local monies to, to set up some radio communications with different areas in our ambulance service. We have a pilot project that might be interesting to you <coughs> right in this very area. It covers between Westington Springs, Miller, DeSmit, Huron, hooks up some of our clinical facilities with our ambulance service to do a better job. And the ambulance personnel are trained in an extensive course, it takes about 81 hours to qualify. And when they come out of this, they're known as emergency medical technicians. They have some of the know-how to do some of the things that you can't as a person when you're bringing somebody in. And to date, we have 917 people have completed this course. And this is recognized pretty much throughout the United States. We need more people, and the goal for this coming year is to train 300 more in South Dakota. Some more things that I might mention along this line that we've been involved in in South Dakota. We have over 6,000 people have been trained in basic emergency care courses. And this is a start of your ambulance service course. It's the first part of it. This course takes about 18 hours to complete. We have about 100,000 citizens in South Dakota that completed the medical self-help course during the last 10 years. There's probably a good deal of you right here that's taken the medical self-help course. This certainly helps in emergencies and especially in rural areas. Am I running out of time, Harvey? I've still got 10 minutes to go, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <coughs> I think some of the things that we have to do in our medics programs and these, we had a pilot project that I'm going to mention here and hurrying this along. In 1972, Senate Bill 1 was passed with an appropriation of about $200,000 to start about five young nurses, or not young nurses, a couple, three of them were married, to put them in an area in southwestern South Dakota where they could be physician's assistants. One of the places that they trained for some of you folks from Gerald County here were from Dr. Dean in Washington Springs. They were placed in the Murdo, Kadoka, White River area. They were even allowed to, uh, through this law, to write prescriptions. They could uh, sew up cuts. They could have prenatal examinations, all sorts of different things. They could do 80% of the things that physicians could do. I think it's important that we go a little farther on this, help more than we have. I think one of the things that I'll tell you about the medics program that, that uh, concerns me, it was designed primarily for rural area assistance directly to your local practitioner. They could work within an area of 50 miles. However, this has now been diverted and although I don't have the facts, it's my belief that it was meant to, to help us with rural health delivery. But I think if you'd look right now, and I intend to look into this, that probably there's more physician's assistance in the city of Sioux Falls than there is all rural South Dakota today. I think that we, some of the legislators are going to look at this. I'm sure I'm going to. I don't think that was the intent of it. It bothers me to start a program and see that we don't have the delivery that we needed in rural areas. We started four-year med school and for all of you, I want you to know that this, in all probability, won't put a doctor in every small town, but it should help. We have a lot of communities that are involved in things like this, and I would like to say this, that some that I'm aware of have offered to pay tuition to students wishing to go to medical school, forgive one year of it for every year they practice in a community. I've also, one community I'm aware of that agreed to build a clinic I suppose a clinic, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand, and turn it over to the doctor to use if they'd come and practice in a certain community. But I think that each of us, even one community, guaranteed a salary, I think, of forty thousand dollars to start, which is not too bad. Physicians are paid not too badly, but you know, health is—you can't count the cost of health. I hope each one of you in here, if your community lacks this, that you'd 
be willing to contact your representative or your senator, not only nationally, but in the state, and see if we can give you some help on these kind of programs. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to hurry Philip along there, but if we all, uh, you know, throw off a whole load, we're not going to have time for question and answers. Henry Poppins is going to talk to you for five minutes. Henry. Thank you, Mr. President. Farmers Union members, it's indeed an honor to be here today. Uh, I think it's a great privilege to come before this very agricultural audience and share some of our views and let you know us some of your concerns. You know, we have a lot of fun in the legislature. Sometimes we have some frustrating moments. And one of the great uh, the fun things is to kind of make a little fun of those people over on the other side, to give them a little rough time, you know. And of course, they're good at uh, giving it back to us. But uh, last winter one time, I was sitting down in the coffee shop, and there were a few uh, representatives sitting there drinking coffee. And uh, you know, one thing I'll have to say for those fellows, they're very honest. Uh, uh, I may not say much more good about them, but I will say that they're very honest. And uh, just to illustrate why I think they're very honest, they were, uh, I believe one of these fellows was in that crowd. Uh, they sat around the coffee, and uh, I don't know just why, but uh, they seemed to be in the confessing mood. And uh, one of them kind of broke down and said, you know, I've got a terrible problem. She said, nobody knows it. But, you know, whenever I go into a store or something, I pick up things. It, I just can't keep from it. He says, I, I, I'm really sorry for it, but I just can't help myself. And about that time, another one broke down and said that he also had a terrible problem, and his was a drinking problem. He uh, said, you know, I don't drink out in public, but uh, whenever I'm home, I just can't leave that bottle alone. Well, the biggest surprise was when the, uh, uh, the third one said, and I just have a hunch it was this radio broadcaster, but uh, he says, you know, I've got a terrible problem. He said, I just can't keep a secret. So uh, uh, I know they're an honest bunch of fellas. Now, to get on with our program, uh, well, I like South Dakota. Uh, whenever I'm gone from South Dakota, I think I want to come back because I like the place. But whenever you go out of state in some areas, you see some signs of activity which I think are lacking in South Dakota. Now, I'll have to admit that I've had somewhat of a change of heart, but I think that we have to look at some system of economic development which is uh, promoted by the state. We are a capital deficient state. One of the reasons that possibly in some areas we haven't developed as we should is that we have, while I'm not making any charges at any financial institutions, we have some of them that are play very close to the belt and are very conservative. We have others that are very good and we'll have to pat them on the back. But we have many areas in this state where we could develop considerably if we had a method of the state pumping or priming the pump. And uh, I'm going to look very closely at the next session at these proposals. Now, the state Interim State Affairs Committee has been uh, looking at these proposals. Uh, I've been reading their minutes. I I'm encouraged by these things. Now, we had considerable discussion on those last year, one of those involved uh, bonding the cement plant. Well, now, while I am not particularly uh, fond of that proposal, I will say that I think we should look into the situation in, in depth. I think there are many worthy agricultural enterprises. There are some uh, economic areas, in, especially in our small towns. One thing that I, uh, one safeguard I'd like to build into any legislation that encourages economic development is that we can keep 
some of the people in the small towns. For years, most of the economic development has been going to the cities. I think uh, even my town of DeSmet is a fine example of three or four uh, rural-oriented industries that are keeping people in our county and in our state. Now, one of the big advantages of that economic opportunity is a tax base for our school system. And another very important part is sales tax. As long as we are so dependent on sales tax, and especially in a time of inflation, uh, we need the sales tax money to fund the, uh, fund our, to use it to fund the programs of our government. Now, uh, Representative Andrews, who isn't here, and I are on the Appropriations Committee, and uh, it's very trying to try and sort out the worthy projects and fund them because we always have the problem, is there enough money to go around? Uh, I think one of the ways is to create some more economic activity and keep, as long as we're so dependent on sales tax, we've got to take measures to keep this sales tax increasing. Now, so much for economic activity and that program of development. Another thing that uh, I'd like to mention, because I'm on the Medical Malpractice Committee, and uh, a Representative Testerman, uh, or Senator Testerman, pardon me, talked uh, about rural health. I think one of the problems that the uh, legislature will look at very closely next year is the medical malpractice problem. One of the things that uh, concerns all of us on the committee is that we're, our costs are so high for medical malpractice in South Dakota. About, I think, if I remember correctly, about seventh in, in the nation, uh, rated right behind some of the more m metropolis states such as New York and California, and most of the members of the committee can't comprehend that our experience has been that bad in South Dakota as far as medical liability is concerned. One of the things I'd like to see, I suppose it's uh, maybe asking a little too much, but I think we should have an actuary of some type in the insurance department so that we knew that these people that are coming from Minneapolis, Chicago, and giving their facts and figures, most of them are representatives of the insurance industry, that we had some very good people in our insurance department to uh, counter their claims. Uh, we, right now, we practically have to take their word for it. Now, why is medical malpractice so serious? The fact, uh, I think, Senator Testimon, uh, Testerman has gone into the, many of the medical health problems. But if we want economic development in the state, we have to have uh, good health care in all areas. But uh, we've funded a four-year medical school in, at the University of South Dakota. Now we need to make sure we can get these doctors to stay in <laughs> South Dakota. If their rates are so uh, out of line or just too high, why, we'll have trouble keeping them. So uh, I'm hopeful that the next session of the legislature can do something to alleviate this medical malpractice uh, problem that we have. Is that about five minutes? Yep. Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> if any of you have specific questions about that, uh, Henry knows a great deal about it and he couldn't get into it, uh, obviously, uh, totally. Representative Clevin, there's a big uh, shrine out in, near Sturgis that uh, is a shrine to Les Clevin. If you knew that or not, they call it Bear Butte. <laughs> Well, you know, I, uh, you said I wasn't rural, and maybe I'm not, but I'll just uh, bet I'm about as rural as anybody up on this panel, at least I was last night. As a matter of fact, if I don't quite stay awake today, why, I have a reason. I'll tell you what it is in just a word or two. I intend to drive over here leisurely last night, uh, and uh, I have a rather busy week. I have to be in Pierre today and tomorrow, and then I'm going to Chicago for a meeting on Friday and Washington on Monday. And I bought a little farm about, uh, oh, about a year ago or so, a ranch, whatever you want to call it. And I made up my mind when I got the thing that I wasn't going to sell anything at a loss. And it hasn't been too successful up till now. Uh, the chickens, I spend four bucks a day feeding them, and I get $2.25 worth of eggs back every day, so I haven't sold much there. And uh, uh, I bought some cattle, and uh, uh, they're Semmentals, and they're going to be good property sometime. Uh, but the herd just keeps growing, and nothing's being sold. 
But I did figure out that there might be some profit in hogs. Matter of fact, you could insure some profit right now if you bought futures. So I went in the hog business, and, and uh, you never do anything halfway in our family, it seems like. And last night, going to be gone all for the next uh, five, six days, there are certain basic things that have to be done with confined hogs before you can leave them. And I was doing that, which was mainly cleaning up one of the uh, buildings they're in, and I had them in another little place. And somehow my little boy came along and opened the door, and I had 200 hogs all over the farm. And we spent a good part of the evening getting them back in and getting them counted, and we did get them all back in. And by the time that job was done, it was just too late to leave last night, so we came this morning. That isn't what I came to talk to you about, though. I came to talk about education. And you can't talk about education without talking about money. <coughs> and so I think we'll just uh, uh, get right down to uh, brass tacks. I chair a committee, uh, which I think some members of the legislature maybe wish should go away. Uh, we were given a job that's uh, been around for a couple of years, and, and uh, it's a, a very dry job, and I'm not going to bore you with it. But our educational system in this state is funded under a program called the Minimum Foundation. And if you make any little change in that formula, it can severely affect the amount of tax that people in certain school districts pay. Uh, there's about $32 million that's distributed one way or another under the Minimum Foundation, $27 million of it plus is uh, state aid to education. And uh, that formula uh, has to be changed at some point in time, uh, but uh, nobody has really wanted to tangle with changing it. We didn't either. We came to the conclusion that our committee did not have the expertise to do the job, and uh, we could certainly end up with a mess if we didn't do it right. After a couple of days of meetings on the subject, why we found that we could do the job, we had $50,000 and 15 meeting days approved. And if you've ever gone before a legislative committee and asked for 15 more days of meetings and $50,000 that wasn't in the budget, well, you go with your hat in hand. I didn't think we had a chance in the world, but somehow the $50,000 appeared, and they approved 10 of the 15 days we wanted, so we went ahead. And, uh, but they said, don't study taxes. We don't want you working on an income tax. We want you working on how you spend the money. Well, our committee had already decided the tax package we were going to propose, so we didn't have to do that. The package that uh, uh, we're talking about, and I see the State Board of Education is talking about one very similar in a publication that uh, uh, came to me uh, just yesterday. We're talking about a, a, uh, a tax, an income tax that raised about $50 million. It had raised half of it by a corporate tax and half of it by an income tax against individuals. That would provide the $46 million that it takes to fund 50% of the cost of elementary and secondary education in this state. It takes another $46 million. South Dakota, I didn't know this until I got into it, but South Dakota is one of three states left in the nation that funds something like 15% or less of the cost of elementary and secondary education by state funding. And that's why when you go out the 1st of May and the 1st of November to pay your taxes, it gets to be such a job because property is paying a disproportionate share of the uh, cost of providing education on the elementary and secondary level. So we had the $50,000 and we've initiated our study of how those funds should be appropriated back. And I really think it's going to be fruitful. We haven't seen all of the results yet. And I, whenever anybody really wants to put us down, they'll say, oh, that's another one of those studies. I don't look at this one as another one of those studies. You can't tamper with a minimum foundation formula that distributes something over $25 million a year by guess or by gosh. You have to know what the changes are going to do to every single school district in this state and every single taxpayer in this state or you're playing with fire. The $50,000 is being spent to make computer runs on the changes that we're going to propose. I just tell you a couple of things that uh, our committee has pretty well decided on besides the fact that it's going to take a new tax source to fund education properly in this state and to provide some tax relief. We're pretty well uh, uh, established on the fact that it takes more than property, ad valorem property, so be it, to determine wealth of a school district. Right now, if you're property rich, you're rich. And there's no consideration given for the retail sales that take place in that district. There's no consideration given for the income of the of the people who live there, their, their annual income per year, and we're working on formulas that might include, as many states have incidentally, we're working on formulas that might establish a district's wealth, in other words, its ability to pay 
for receiving state educational funds back. Uh, we're working on a plan that would certainly include income and possibly would include other factors like the ability to generate revenue within that school district from retail sales. We're pretty well decided that if you're going to put $50 million of new money in on the top from state funding, there has to be substantial tax relief on the local level. We're talking in terms of about half of that being a mandatory mill levy rollback and about half of it being left to your local school board to fund inflation or to provide additional local tax, re uh, tax reform or additional local tax rebate on the local level if the plan should pass. You don't get working on a project like this without in being involved with some very interesting people. I was at a conference a few days ago uh, with people like myself from the other 50 states where we were talking about plans for uh, education and some of the reform that's taken place in other states. The state of Florida, I think, has an interesting concept that I'm going to propose to the committee uh, tomorrow when we meet, and that is a waiting process that waits elementary students. It has been pointed out to us that pupils learn 90 percent of what they're going to learn between the time they enter kindergarten and by the time they reach puberty, which is about 12 or 13 years of age. And still, most of our money, a large share of our money, I should say, is spent on a high school program. And we spend peanuts, really, on elementary students. Uh, it, occurs to, it occurred to the state of Florida, and they passed a plan like this, that says, mandates, uh, that there will be uh, sufficient uh, funds available at the first, second, third, and fourth grade levels so that those kids get started off right. Uh, I'm sure, too, that another, this is a technicality, but another thing that's happening in this state that's happened in other states that our committee is going to try to incorporate into our plan is that we have the vocational people come in and they lobby for a lot of money. The special education people come in, they lobby for a lot of money. Other special interest groups come in uh, wanting funds for education. We feel it should all be in one pot and should be uh, uh, allocated back on a weighted per pupil basis so that you get all of your state aid for vocational education, special education, the whole ball of wax uh, from the state in one payment. I'd be happy to answer any questions about this later. I'm excited about the plan. I agree with Ben Radcliffe. I think this is the year. Well, that's good to hear. Lars Herseth, please, is going to talk about the referendum question. I think you all know what that might uh, involve. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow members in the House and the Senate, Lieutenant Governor Wallman. See, since I'm on the other side in what we refer to as the greater house down there, I don't have to refer to Harvey as uh, Mr. President. In fact, most of the time I can refer to him as whatever I want. Uh, today, the topic that I have chosen is the question that undoubtedly will be coming before the House and the Senate in Pier this coming fall, this winter, and that is the question of a Wahi referendum. <coughs> now, I don't pretend in these few minutes that I have here to get into the pros or the cons of the Wahi question. Uh, that would take more than the entire legislative session, I'm afraid. So I would like to point out from what I have been able to find out in the last few weeks since uh, this has been being proposed of what exactly would it entail to the legislature. What would groundwork will they have to set up and how would they set that groundwork up? In the first place, the legislature does not even have the power to set up a referendum. Uh, in a court decision or attorney general's opinion in 1927, it was stated that on popular issues such as whatever they may be, whether it's a Wahi referendum or what, cannot have action taken upon them by the legislature to simply bring them to the vote. One possible course of action, I suppose, would be that if it were initiated, initiated in whatever district the voters were going to vote on it on, this is what another area that brings up considerable problems. Who can hold this election? Who in state law is qualified and has the power to hold this? Does the Conservancy subdistrict have that power? Your Conservancy subdistricts do have the power to hold elections. 
A number one area is on boundaries, who should be in that conservancy subdistrict and who should not. And number two is on elections on accepting federal contracts. But they do not have the power to institute a referendum on a topic such as a Wahi yes or a Wahi no. That power would have to be given them to them by the state le legislature through a statute change. Now, as you can see, just in getting the power developed in order to uh, have a referendum, there are numerous problems. But let's assume for a moment that uh, we have established that we are able to hold a referendum. And then what problems do we have? It, uh, in my opinion, has been somewhat popular lately to uh, say, yes, let's have a referendum, let's have a yes, let's have a no. Two of our uh, federal congressional representatives have suggested that. They have left it up to the legislature. And yet, it seems conveniently, they have ignored, perhaps, the who, the what, the where, and the when of such a referendum. In other words, what are we actually going to vote on? Are we going to take a broad statement dealing with Oahe and say, yes, we're for the continued development of Oahe as planned, or no, we are not? Or are we going to vote on the master contracts that the subconservancy districts and the game fishing parks have with the federal government? Are we going to vote on those contracts that the irrigation districts themselves have with the Bureau of Reclamation? In other words, exactly what are we going to vote on? And this has to be important because if there is not agreement as to what exactly we'll vote on, there would be no merit at all in a referendum. If the two sides, so to speak, in this particular case, cannot agree and say, yes, we will abide by what this referendum, the outcome of this referendum is, then it would serve no warrant if that agreement cannot be found. Then you run across the question of who should be allowed to vote. It has been said that possibly the whole state of South Dakota should vote. But yet as the lawyer or the worker in Sioux Falls or Rapid City, is he impacted and affected as greatly as that individual in Spank County or in Brown County or in Beetle County? I think that perhaps and I have my own feelings on that. I know the farmer, uh, United Family Farmers have suggested that a five-county area be the only area allowed to vote. And yet where the one is so large that maybe it is not exactly representative of what should happen with Oahe, I think perhaps the other is guilty of being so small. The other area that would seem to me the most logical would be the 15 and a half county area compromising of the Oahe sub Conservancy District. It would seem that this area, though within that area there are numerous <coughs> gauges and qualities of who is infected most or impacted most, it would be the most representative area to hold such an election if such an election is possible to be held. And of course the when of the election, if the legislature has to come up with statute changes, which they could deal with in the next legislative session, and I'm sure will be asked to deal with, then of course those do not take effect until July 1st of 1976, and it would be only logical that it would be held the next general election. For probably two reasons, one being, uh, of course, the timing, and uh, number two, number two would be the timing along with uh, the general question as to getting the better turnout uh, rather than holding a special election and a number of people caring about the project but yet maybe not caring enough to go vote. So to just briefly recap this as to what your legislature will be looking at and I'm sure uh, receiving ideas from you and looking forward to those ideas, and that is a statute change allowing and empowering a certain part of our state government to hold a referendum on Oahe. And then, of course, they would have to, at the same time, empower a certain body to come up with the wording of that referendum itself. And then, of course, who will vote? 
And if I might, for just a minute, uh, if I'm not getting too close to my time, close, I might like to say my own particular view on the referendum question itself. And that I wonder if South Dakotans are really ready to make that decision and make that a final decision. Are those that are somewhat against the project or against certain aspects of the project ready to say, no, this plan is not good, we want to eliminate it entirely? Are we ready to say no to those economic advantages that could come to this whole area of South Dakota and to South Dakota as a result? Or on the other hand, are we ready to say yes to the project design that is instituted in the Wahi plan? Or is, are there some other avenues? Perhaps uh, maybe we can uh, get some help from our federal and congressional delegation. That it seems that the center crux of the problem of those that support it say we cannot take the time to try to redesign it or to try to alleviate some of the problems that are pointed up to us because we will lose our federal funding. Is there some way, and I would think that uh, as well as the state legislature can find a way to hold a referendum, if that is the people's wishes, then it would seem to me possible also that our national representatives and our congressional delegation can also find a way to hold those funds perhaps in escrow and give South Dakotans a year or two to say, okay, here's an alternative to Wahi. Here's a certain aspect of Wahi that we don't particularly like, but it can be changed and it can be solved. This is kind of the approach that I would like to see. I happen to think that right now a referendum uh, would almost be impossible to attain a good result from because I don't think between the two groups that agreement could be reached on what we'd vote on. But this is exactly what we're going to be faced with in the legislative session, and I'd certainly welcome any of your remarks. And I thank Farmers Union for asking me to be a guest on this panel, and thank you. Andy Weiss, who's uh, filling in now sort of at the spur of the moment for Jim Andrews, but uh, he can handle it. Representative Weiss. Thank you, Harvey, <clears throat> fellow legislators, and ladies and gentlemen of this convention. Little did I dream this morning when I left home at 5 o'clock that I would be a part of this panel. I came out to attend the breakfast, of which I had been a part of here a few years ago in Washington. And while I was eating, Ben came over and wanted to know if I would fill in for Jim, uh, Jim Endries. And I said, uh, well, it depends. What do you want me to talk about? Well, he says taxes. Well, I uh, was somewhat different from at home because my wife told, has told me different times she said, when we're going to have company, she says, now, don't bring up taxes, whatever. <laughs> and so uh, I guess one of the reasons for that, it was one of the things that brought me into the uh, political arena. I've been terribly dissatisfied with our tax structure in South Dakota, <clears throat> and I've always been interested in thinking that it should be changed. I also, probably most of you remember, seven years ago when I went to the legislature, I sponsored or authored, or co-authored, I should say, a bill that was sponsored by the Farm, uh, South Dakota Farmers Union. However, it didn't make a person very popular at that time, and especially a freshman. When you talked about, uh, seven years ago, when you talked about income tax around the chambers, and I think others perhaps uh, Henry Poppin, who was there at that time, could vouch that it was a kind of a dirty word if you mentioned income tax. And the fact is we didn't even get it out of the committee. And the only way we did get it into the records, uh, Roy Johnson and I and Swenson and Elwood, we hoghoused it one day so we could get it into the journal that we did author that bill out there. Well, enough on that. <clears throat> I have always been an advocate of an income tax, and I'm not going to go over uh, what Les just stated, 
Uh, I'm not on the interim tax committee. Uh, I, I serve on the appropriations committee with Henry and Jim Henrys. And uh, I, I do think that if we're going to give additional uh, money to education, we should find another way to fund it. As most of you know, at present, about 70% of the local taxes goes for education. And it's far too great a burden for uh, the local level to handle. So I, for one, and along with others, have uh, been an advocate of an income tax. Uh, I, want us all, I can also bring you the message that uh, the mood around the chambers in the last seven years has changed a lot. People that were absolutely opposed to an income tax, such as SDA, uh, have two years ago came up with their own tax. And so uh, I have hopes that we're going to have an e income tax in the near future. I am disappointed when it comes to, uh, <coughs> when I hear people say, and I guess I was a little bit disappointed when I heard one of the senators say that we should increase the sales tax. Now, I don't know just how he meant that, but I, I don't think, if there's ever a regressive tax to me, it's the sales tax. Uh, I, I think that we should, if anything, I want to eliminate part of it. I'd like to take the, the sales tax off of food, for instance, but serving on the Appropriations Committee, let's not forget that when you take anywhere from 15 to 20 million dollars off, that somehow this money has to be replaced. And so if we're going to do those things, uh, take off some sales tax here, or we have to replace it uh, other ways. One of the reasons that I'm so in favor, and I'm sure others feel as I do in regards to an income tax, I've always thought that people should pay taxes according to their ability to pay. And how other could we do it in South Dakota than to do it that way? I, have all, I want to also say, and this is my own opinion, that along with initiating an income tax, I would also like to see the personal property tax repealed. So I have no quarrel with Farmers Union on that particular issue. And I think if you will look back through my voting records and the bills that I have authored, you will find that this is the things that I have stood for. So. I guess that uh, uh, without taking too much more time, uh, I, I just want to say uh, I understand why we need more taxes or more money revenue. And the reason is, is because of the de demands of the people. And I'm as guilty of that as anyone. But the only th the thing that I think would be far more fair is to revamp our tax structure so that people will pay according to their ability to pay. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I think in defense of Henry Poppin, I have to say that Henry Poppin isn't for increasing sales tax by percentage. He was only talking about priming the pump so we had more business activity so that more sales tax dollars would be uh, generated. And I think that uh, that, that was I, the... I just I don't know if you were just uh, needling him a little, but that, I'm sure that's the interpretation. <laughs> Bob Weber uh, is our final speaker, and then we're going to give you a chance to respond. Bob? Thank you, Harvey. <clears throat> Fellow legislators, Farmers Union friends, I just envy last when he talked about his rush he had back home the past two weeks. I've had two kids in the hospital, and the wife staying with the kids, and they come out here. Uh, last yesterday and was on the resolutions committee, so I haven't had much chance to get too much of a speech short myself. I'd like to say that the resolutions are mostly on the board back there. If some of you want to look at some of the resolutions that have been handed in, they will be adopted this afternoon, those if you want to adopt them. A few years ago, I went to Washington, D.C. on a trip down. We took our neighbor along, a farmer who thought he'd buy some property in Washington, D.C. Uh, he got down and he looked down and he found some property, but uh, it was a little bit too high priced and he didn't have enough money, so the guy said, well, go over to the First National Bank, you can get the money over there. 
So he went over to the First National Bank, and the gal says, yeah, she says, you come back here, we'll go back and see the president. So she took him down to a beautiful big bank and a lot of corridors, and got back in the back. She had a beautiful lounge. She sat him down, and she said, you wait here, and pretty quick, a great big guy come in about the size of less here, and bought a $400 suit on and about a $4 cigar, and he walked up, and he says, Alfred J. Cobbs is the name, president of the First National Bank. What can I do for you? He says, John C. Hicks is the name. I'm a farmer from South Dakota, and I want to borrow some money. He said, boy, this guy, he's a good one. I want to have some fun with him. He said, uh, he said you know what we do at Country Hicks out here in Washington, D.C.? No, John says, I don't know what you do at Country Hicks, but I'll guarantee out in the country work, and we know what we do at Cobbs. <laughs> As many of us probably know, seagulls usually group together and stand against the wind. This is so they don't get their feathers ruffled and they can work together. I think a lot of us could learn a lot from what our seagull friends do. I know a lot of times it's hard to uh, uh, group on this, but I think many times our cooperatives, for instance, uh, today, last year, delivered 25% of the grain to our export terminals and still less than 7% was actually exported. I believe it's just a lack of cooperation between our co-ops and our giants down on the other end. I also believe that in a recent uh, grain embargo that we had on, I think it was a poor stand, who not able to understand each other, talking together, and uh, getting a better understanding on this with our grain deal to Russia. Also, I think if a lot of people understood the thing, I believe we possibly could have an uh, agricultural man in the Department of Agriculture in Washington, here on our own level in the state. Last year, we spent six times as much for the ADC program as we did for agriculture in the state of South Dakota. I think this is outrageous. But uh, I believe that we can work together on some of this stuff out in Pier. I know the state level, being in Pier for three years, I am positive that many of the bills are defeated because the legislators don't understand them, including myself. I believe that all major bills, one that concerns the whole state, should be introduced at least 30 days prior to the session. This would give us a chance to better understand them and get the people's view on them. There are a lot of certain, certainly a lot of bills in here and a lot of issues that's going to be up this year that's going to be very important issues out there. Uh, you take your weather modification, is going to be a real hassle issue in here if they're going to get any money. Land use, malpractice insurance, of course taxation, Oahe has been touched on, taxation some, and certainly education is less said. One of these issues which I am vice chairman of is the interim committee on special education. Our goal has been to secure input from people across the state to help in solving some of the problems in special education. We started with a voluntary task force of 22 of the top officials from the institutions in special education throughout the state. One of the things that we have learned is that 40% of all the handicapped children today in our institutions could have been trained so that they could have supported themselves today if we would have provided that training years ago. The problem, should we provide it now for our younger handicapped so that they can support themselves, or later on should they be, neglect them and leave them into in the institutions and support them the rest of our lives? This is going to take more tax dollars. Les has brought up some that he talked on. And as you know, last year, one-fourth of the people in the state of South Dakota with 25% of the income paid 44% of the taxes, and you know what people that was. Our corporate tax that was defeated last year really made me sick. In fact, the other day, I spoke of working together and not getting ruffled. But I nearly turned my back when I read a piece in the Minneapolis paper that was given to me by a neighbor. It's a six-inch column. It says, your state corporate income tax in South Dakota will be three zeros if you take industry in South Dakota. It also goes on to say Minnesota's tax rate of 12 percent makes it the highest out of 50 states. The second highest is Pennsylvania. 
There are five states with no corporate income tax, but only one of them has the lowest per capita tax lowered in the country, South Dakota. No corporate income tax, no personal income tax, and a five-year tax moratorium on new plants of other structures. I think this is preposterous when you talk about we probably want industry in the state, but how long can we be Santa Claus to these kind of out-of-state corporations when they come in here, take the dollars out of South Dakota, the cream, and leave us the skim milk, and a lot of times ain't even the skim milk left. <laughs> I believe now that we're probably going to have to work harder than ever for a state income tax and a corporate tax. But like Les said, if we can pick up half of this on out-of-state corporations, they talk about that the prices will go up in the state of South Dakota on your merchandise if we put a corporate tax in here. Well, we checked out Sears and Roebuck over in Minnesota, and they got a 12% corporate tax, and these prices were the same in South Dakota as they was in Minnesota. If this is so, then we are building the schools in Minnesota today, and I think it's about time we got a corporate tax in South Dakota where we can get some of the gravy that's been going out of the state of South Dakota. I thank you. Now it's uh, your turn to respond uh, to what's been said. There have been areas that haven't been covered at all that uh, you would like some discussion on. We'd uh, ask you to uh, feel very free in expressing yourself. Now I think most of you had been given cards to write a question on. I'd like to see the pages now. Take them uh, immediately from those of you that are ready. So just <clears throat> these uh, young people will move through the crowd if you have a question that you'd like to uh, hand to one of them. Uh, get the question. I think we have a committee up here of uh, several that will sort of sort the questions and uh, hand them to me and I'll read the question and who it's addressed to, if that's the case. And uh, at that point, we'll try and have a discussion that includes all of you. And while we're waiting for that, it's a terribly uh, simple thing to uh, have opinions on questions facing South Dakota, and it becomes a very complex thing when you're actually sitting in the chair, you know, in peer. I found that out from my uh, own experience. I was much more of an expert on everything before I got there than after I had been there a while because I found out that no matter how absurd a question was, that there are two legitimate points of view, or maybe three or four or five legitimate points of view on almost every question. And it's our job as legislators, as governmental leaders that you've elected and entrusted these responsibilities to try and lead us in the, lead you, the people, in the right direction. And that's a big, big job. I don't think that in most areas we have done all so badly. Most of the things that we've done have been applauded by the public. Most of the things that we've done have been done to meet needs. But there are some areas that are very glaring in the way that uh, we haven't acted or the problems that we've had reaching a consensus. And certainly this whole area of tax reform, and I can respect the person who is really for a corporate income tax or opposed to one. Uh, I have my own views there, and they're pretty well known. But uh, there are two sides to these things, and we want, uh, hopefully, with a discussion with you and with the public, to uh, form some consensuses so the legislature feels more comfortable in pointing the way that we should go. There's another whole philosophical problem here. We're ready for the questions any time. I'm just going to keep talking, and I can do that, believe it or not. Uh, there's a philosophical problem here that a lot of legislators have. Now, if you were a legislator, just to say, you know, all of a sudden you were going to be in the legislature, what would your attitude be uh, when it comes to this certain area that I want to talk about? Would you try and follow what you believe to be a consensus in your district, or would you try and lead people to a consensus? That's a fundamental question that every legislator has to face. It's a tough one. What do you do? Do you follow what people are telling you, or do you lead out and try and lead them to a consensus when no consensus exists? And that's the big dilemma that you'd have, that every legislator has, and everybody views that a little differently. Okay. I think uh, Mr. Testerman, it's addressed to you. 
Uh, what are your views on the use of cement plant monies for use and promotion of irrigation projects or other private economic development? Uh, you can uh, answer the question right from where you're sitting. Let's test the mic, though, uh, to make sure it works. Is this live? Can right. you hear me? It's good. Okay. The question is, would I, what would be my view on cement plant funds to use for project of uh, economic development? I can tell you that about, uh, I, I'm not real certain on this, it was three years ago, I believe it was, I sponsored a bill with my seatmate, Bert Anderson from Chamberlain, to start and have the state fund an irrigation project in Buffalo County, which is west of Gann Valley, north of, of Chamberlain. And we funded that to the tune of, I think, a couple hundred thousand dollars or a quarter of a million dollars, somewhere in there. The federal funding on this, had they went federal, these five farmers that asked for this, they will repay at the state of South Dakota at a lower interest rate, of course. Was the, their funding there was a, a half million dollars was going to be the cost on a state if we planned it for them. The federal would have been one million dollars. Looks sensible to me that we help them out with this. The reason I bring it out is because this is something that happened. We did get this bill passed in the House and the Senate was signed. This irrigation district right today is operating very successfully. We're using some of that Oahe water on that land down, well, just west of Fort Thompson. I was down there and I see some of the corn there a year ago. Uh, we had a drought in the area that I live in and I'm sure all of you, we know how dry it was. But I saw that corn sell for $500 an acre for silage. So I know that it helps. And so I, yes, who owns the state cement plant? Every one of you and me sitting right in this room and every other citizen in South Dakota. If we can help South Dakota with economic development by using cement plant funds, I'd vote for it in a minute. I think the answer to the question was yes. So. <laughs> <clears throat> this is addressed to anyone uh, on the panel. You people that ask the questions don't mind if I don't identify you, do you? If you want to get up and say, I asked that question, I have this to say, feel free to do that if you don't take too long. But uh, sometimes uh, personalizing them doesn't prove all that much, unless you want to do it that way. To anyone on the panel, is it necessary to raise salaries and wages every new moon? Uh, apparently, uh, salary increases that are talked about to bother this person a great deal. Does somebody want to talk about uh, the salary uh, question? I'm sure that you're talking about governmental empl uh, employees or people that are elected. Anybody want to address that? Go ahead, Henry. Uh, I'm afraid I can't give you a, a yes or a no, but I think Representative Weiss and I on the Appropriations Committee are faced with that fact, and uh, I think by and large talk a little closer some can't hear you Get by right. and there large uh, we have we knew know that we're going to have to give something with the cost of living as it is but I think both of us on that committee and we sit next together and discuss these things that we have been reluctant to uh, go very far in this situation but uh, we've got to face some issues if you've got good people in state government and you find that uh, they are going to private enterprise or that they are going to other states, uh, it might be cheaper to give them a small increase than to lose them altogether and train people that are inexperienced. Now, I've been uh, probably as uh, slow to give an increase as anyone, but uh, I guess you just got to face the facts that you, you uh, have to be... Uh, have to give a little in that respect and uh, I think Andy's probably agrees with me on that. I'd have to agree with him uh, on that and I'd also like to add that after all if we take a look at our own business and uh, how much the expenses have increased there along with our cost of living on the farm I mean uh, our food and such uh, I also think they are entitled uh, to some raise and we did give the four hundred dollars plus two and a half percent, which was a, a rather small raise, uh, I'd have to say, but uh, that's what it turned out to be. How many people in this room think that our elected people, we're not talking about congressional people, our state elected people, the governor, lieutenant governor, everybody knows he's underpaid, but I mean, legislators, uh, judges, how many, how many of you think that they're overpaid? I'd like to see your hand. How many think they're overpaid? How many think it's about right? And obviously you know what the third question is. It's about right what they're getting. How, 
How many of you think that they're entitled, uh, as industry is entitled uh, or gets, uh, cost of living uh, increases to make their wages competitive? How many of you think they deserve a small increase, in other words? Well, uh, there seems to be, the status quo seems to be sort of a comfortable position to take, and that, that doesn't uh, surprise me too much. The overwhelming number think that uh, the salaries are about in the range where uh, they're acceptable. A uh, few of you think that they're uh, maybe overpaid, and some of you think that uh, perhaps they could stand a raise, but the overwhelming position was uh, they're making enough. I think we spent enough time on that one. Uh, Henry Poppin, Senator Aberesk and Congressman Pressler have recommended a referendum on Oahe. Do you agree? Now they're going to pin you down here, which is a fair question. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. Well, I've Talk been right into it, Henry. I've been asked to uh, go on the uh, uh, referendum, and I think uh, I've told those people that possibly I personally would favor the referendum. However, I think uh, Representative Herseth brought up some of the things that I told those people that asked me to be on a bill sponsoring a referendum. I told them I, at the present time I don't think we can do it. There's too many unanswered questions. So uh, you aren't going to see me on a uh, uh, bill or any legislation asking for a referendum. Uh, I'd like to see what machinery we have in state government, uh, and uh, I'm sympathetic, but uh, not uh, to the point of, uh, I just don't think a referendum is constitutional, so uh, that's about the answer to the question. Okay. Although the question was addressed to you, Senator, does anybody else wish to uh, address that subject? The other uh, panel members. Anybody I, want to say anything briefly? My name is, my yep. name is going to be on a referendum. Uh, my name is going to be on a referendum bill, and I have this view. I live out west where it isn't going to make an awful lot of difference, and I think the people who are going to be affected should make the decision. And I really hate to vote either way on it because it's going to affect you people who live in the area much more than it is us. Anybody else wish to make a comment on that one? Well, I, believe that. I believe that we would have to go along with a referendum. Like if Lars said, if we could come up with some vision where the boundaries would be, uh, and this would uh, depend a lot on the referendum. But as I stand now, I believe I would go along with a referendum to find out what the people feel if we could come up with the right boundaries on this to see where these boundaries are going to be. I would hate to see it get outside the boundaries because there would be a lot of votes bought and that wouldn't be legal. Okay, we have some problem with people uh, hearing apparently, so speak right into the mic. I know it sounds loud up here, but uh, just do it. Anybody else want to say anything, uh, Lars, on that uh, question? I know I've already expounded uh, perhaps too long on Right the into subject. it, Lars. Get right into the mic there, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, there it's better. I know I've already said uh, a number of things on this subject, but I think I too can go along with a referendum if the two opposing sides can show me a referendum that those two sides can go along with. If there's something that common ground that we can meet on, fine, let's have a referendum. If one side or the other is going to be against that referendum, then it's futile, in my opinion. Thank you. Well, I think that gives you some idea of the uh, uh, mixed opinion among the legislators, and it'll certainly be uh, a major issue. There's no question about that. And. Uh, Hopefully, if it's approached right, uh, the issue can be uh, resolved uh, by the legislature. Hopefully, that, that will be true. To Phil Testerman, what are you and your colleagues doing about malpractice insurance? I think Henry touched on that. Uh, if you'd want to speak on that one or defer what to What are Henry we doing whatever. about malpractice insurance? I'm sorry, I can tell you this, that I don't serve on the committee. I don't know whether anyone on the panel serves on the malpractice Oh, Henry's on the. Henry's on it. He's on the summer interim study, and I know that they've went into this a long time. I got my own personal feeling on it. I can tell you that, and I have never appeared before their committee this summer. And I think that in medical malpractice insurance should be treated the same way that we do wrongful death on highways in South Dakota. Thirty thousand is a limit on that. I think that malpractice, in order to get the premium down, that you have to put a limit on the amount that you can sue for. You can sue a doctor for a million dollars, and how many doctors we got? Very few. Their insurance premium immediately will go up. 
We had malpractice insurance that was sold to these five nurses I referred to you about. Had quite a time with that, getting insurance for these people that were practitioners or uh, in the program that I spoke about earlier in the Kadoka area and, and White River and down through there. Uh, they were finally covered. Uh, they, they had something that the insurance company had never done. Incidentally, there's very, very few companies that sell malpractice insurance. It's a different field. Henry can tell you more about that because he's been on the interim study. Let me uh, uh, ask another question, Henry, since I think this will conclude the ones on the malpractice and then we'll switch to something else. How come malpractice insurance rates are so high in South Dakota since we really don't have that much of a problem here? How come South Dakota rates seventh in the nation in mal... So you can address the whole subject uh, briefly and try and straighten uh, uh, as many people out as you can and share your knowledge with them. Okay, thanks. Uh, one thing I'd like to remark, I suppose most of you people will be here at the convention tonight, but at 9 o'clock on educational TV, the, uh, there will be a program on medical malpractice, and uh, we'll go into very much of this discussion only in greater detail. Uh, one of the things that it's hard for our committee to believe is that we should be rated as the seventh, uh, worst. seventh worst state. Uh, that's one of the reasons we think we should have an actuary in the insurance department. Uh, these uh, independent insurance uh, groups come and say, well, uh, this is where you are, and we have no way of refuting their statements. Um, I, I don't believe we deserve that seventh rating. Uh, they claim that we have had a lot of suits. We haven't had a lot of suits for a lot of money, but we've had a lot of suits, and, and uh, those things string on for so many years that it's uh, hard to say. But some of the things that have been discussed in the committee, I think you'll probably you might see uh, some restrictions on contingency fees. There's uh, many states have said that uh, over $200,000, uh, there would be a limit on what the attorneys uh, could uh, take in. Uh, I think most of the committee thinks for the smaller uh, claims that uh, they should go out the present fee schedule. I think another thing that uh, will probably come out of the committee is to take off this, uh, so many times when there's a suit you read in the paper about it's a great big suit, I think there will probably be a recommendation that no specific amount be mentioned, that it's only for damages and uh, probably a little, uh, go a little slow on pain and suffering so that we can get the amount down. Has this, uh, let me ask a question because I want to know, has this whole matter of malpractice insurance and the work of your committee sort of boil down to a struggle between the medical profession and the legal profession. Uh, I know I made a remark in the press one time that I thought that uh, claims against doctors ought to be limited by statute because I thought they were unreasonably high. And I got a biggest pile of nasty letters that I've ever received from uh, personal injury lawyers where they gave me, said, before you said this, I gave you credit for some brains, and now we know you don't know anything. And as, as you've had that experience, is it a struggle between uh, the legal eagles and the, and the medical profession, or is there more to it than that, or, or what? Well, I think that we've had some of that, but what the committee has tried to do is to have the medical people and the legal people sit down and come to some common ground. Now. Uh, we will have a recommendation from their, uh, the uh, South Dakota Medical Association and from the Bar Association, and we're seriously considering a screening program where some of these medical, where we'll go through a committee before we go to court, and maybe we can get, keep some of these things out of court. Now, the court costs are uh, considerable, and if we could keep a lot of these cases out of court, I think we could cut down the medical practice costs. So. Uh, uh, we're trying to get these people's heads knocked together a little so that uh, before we get to court, we definitely have a, uh, confl a definite conflict. Okay. I think we'll leave that uh, subject then since that, uh, the question, a couple others about uh, uh, the land bank proposal, and then we have several others on the Oahe project, and we'll have to get back to that because a lot of the questions deal with that. But uh, to, to uh, deal with this thing, I know the, the Farmers Union Convention, the speaker he had here yesterday, made quite a thing about the Canadian land bank and that being a uh, kind of proposal that might be transferable down here. Uh, there's two questions. What about a land bank or some system to keep our young people on the land? Uh, is the state going to work on legislation to help young farmers get started into farming? 
Now, I think the questions are uh, related to this concern that the Farmers Union particularly has on making it possible for young farmers to get in and stay in farming. What is the legislature going to do about this? What have they talked about, if anything? Now, some of you that haven't, uh, Andy, would you care to address that or, uh, or Bob, just briefly? If you, well, if you don't know, just say you don't know. I'll just briefly say, I think one of the things that could help is, uh, is tax reform. Uh, on young farmers starting, uh, there would be some uh, uh, tax relief there. Uh, if, as far as, uh, I don't know whether you were speaking, Harvey, and, or they were asking the questions in terms of uh, money that was to be appropriated or grants, or how, what did they mean by that? Uh, so far, we haven't done anything along that line that I know of, and uh, as to whether there's any intent of it, I cannot say. Bob, you want to comment further? I would just say that after listening part of the talk yesterday that was given uh, by the gentleman from uh, Canada, uh, North Dakota is going to have a bill in the legislature this year. That bill has already been drafted. I understand Minnesota is going to have a bill in their legislature. Uh, we have a resolution in back there uh, asking the Farmers Union to uh, support and work with all other farm organizations to uh, support the uh, Sasquan Land Bank. So I'm sure there is going to be some going on in the future through legislation on this. Uh, whether we're going to get it in South Dakota or not, I don't know. But North Dakota is proposing this year and Minnesota is proposing a bill. So. OK, there seems to be, I guess the answer to the question was there's interest and discussion in Minnesota and North Dakota. And perhaps it'll catch on here. I'll tell you how it'll catch on the quickest. And that's if you uh, continue to put on some pressure on the legislature to, uh, to do it. And uh, we hope to have some proposals along those lines that, uh, that are workable for our area. And I would predict that there, that there will be. Uh, there are several questions here that uh, uh, on the Oahe uh, question again. And uh, I think we should... Uh, take this one probably first. I think it's a feeler question on the part of someone. It says to anyone, will the next legislature vote against the Oahe project as it now stands? In other words, I think what this person is saying, given the Oahe project as the legislature understands it, and if they had the power to vote yes or no, how would they vote? I think that's, the, I think that's what this person means. Given the, 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 the project as they understand it, public sentiment for and against it, uh, and so on. If they had a chance to vote, how would they vote? Does anyone, anybody want to venture a guess on your experience? How would the Senate vote, Philip? You want to take a guess on that? You don't have to if you don't want to. I will, but you don't you know, have there's to. A, <clears throat> there's one thing that I kind of like about the Senate over the House. I served in the House and we had our new scoreboard go in, you know, and your score all comes up to it. In the Senate, I vote next to last. And so you can sit there and watch your vote pretty close if you want to. This isn't a fair way to do it, but we do. And <clears throat> I would say in the Senate that probably, I think they'd vote for Hawaii. I'm just guessing that they would. I'd have to lobby a little bit to see first. I'd that would be your inclination, though. And that's all you can do, because yeah. you haven't asked anybody, but that would be your inclination. How about you, Henry? From my experience of last year, I think that it would narrowly win in the Senate. Uh, the Hawaii project would stand as far as... That the sentiment in the Senate would be yes. pro Hawaii by a narrow margin. By a very narrow margin. That, that's your opinion now. Okay, how about the House guys? Now, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to, if you don't know, but if you'd like to share that, I think it's a legitimate question, and I think you can answer. Lars? Well, of course, uh, we wouldn't know unless that problem were right there, but we could go into a little history of what we had in the House last session, and of course, it would be the same members. There was a resolution for a moratorium, which narrowly failed, and I think there were a few uh, that voted against the moratorium that if the situation were reversed and the resolution was calling in full support of the present plan of Hawaii, where I think that also would fail in the House today. You think that if the Oahe, as it's understood, the present plan were voted on in the House, it would fail? Yes, I That's do. That's your opinion. Okay, I wanted to make sure that that was stated right. Andy, would you agree? If you don't have to respond, if you don't know, but if you, if you want to, you may. I, I think I, that's a fair I question. I think that uh, it would fail if it uh, were voted on in the House. I think support for the project wouldn't be there if it was voted on the House. Mm -hmm. 
Les, is that your opinion? If you care to answer, you don't, you don't have to, but just the way well, you I, read the house. The I'm not ducking the question. I just don't honestly know. I, would, I was just talking to Lars about it before you called on Lars. I felt the vote on the moratorium might have been a pretty good uh, uh, test vote, and I guess I would say it would be very, very close, and maybe it could just narrowly squeeze by. Bob? Uh, well, I'm sure that regardless of, as far as I'm concerned, it would uh, fail in the House uh, because there's a lot of questions I think that isn't answered and I think it's getting more harder for the legislators to try to understand this than it is uh, out there because every day you get in more questions on both sides and I believe it would fail quicker now either way in, in the House than it did last year. There's one interesting comment I could make about the legislative attitude toward Oahe. When I was chairman of the Legislative Research Council Executive Board, uh, as chairman I sent out a letter to all the legislators, this wasn't last year, it was two years ago now, asking them if they'd be interested participating in a forum, educational forum on Oahe, so they could have both sides of the picture presented to them. And out of 105 legislators, we got about six or seven responses and there wasn't much interest in it because nobody really knew anything about it and they didn't particularly care. Now all of a sudden this whole issue is raised up to a high visibility level in my opinion would be that they don't know any more about it than they did two years ago. So maybe it's something, an effort that should be done uh, 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 educationally. I would certainly be in favor of that and uh, let the, the proponents and opponents, uh, if the legislature is going to get involved in this, my particular view is they're not ready to make a decision on it because they simply don't know. And they will know uh, if the question is, is posed to them. Much effort will be uh, extended, I think, on both sides to get them up to a knowledge level so that they can make an intelligent uh, decision uh, on the question. But right now, my own opinion would be that it would be a very uh, uh, uneducated kind of response on the part of most legislators, because I asked them, particularly the ones out of the area, and they don't know uh, the Oahe project from the Grand Coulee Dam. And uh, they'd, they'd better get informed about what we have to lose if it goes through, what we have to lose if, it's, uh, if, we, if it fails. And there's a lot of education that needs to be done before the legislature, statewide at least, is capable of making that judgment. That's just my opinion. Uh, let's see if there are any others. Uh, there's, there's some comments here, but they aren't really in the form of, of questions. Somebody wanted to see Larry Presser suggested pipeline seriously considered, but it isn't in the form of a question. See if there's any others here. Uh, studies about the cost per acre, that kind of thing, which are, are kind of technical questions. What will be the cost of carrying coal by the slurry system as compared to the railroad? I really don't know that that's a state legislative issue. What will happen to the water if we don't use it or someone else down the line gets it? That's a, a very, very old question. I think that's a debatable one that doesn't have a real a firm answer. And see if there's any others that uh, can be given a, an answer that really means something. Let's see. How, here's one. How long legally do we have to make a decision on Oahe and how soon can other states come in and take our water? Does anybody know the time frame? Henry doesn't, Phil yeah, doesn't, don't. I don't. Nobody seems to know the length of time. <laughs> it's been a long time <laughs> since the original uh, authorization to now. I guess it's been almost uh, 20 years. Whether it could be another uh, 20, I think it's a matter of conjecture. I don't think there's a good answer on that. That's, uh, those are the major ones that have to do with that, with that subject. I think it's interesting to note, the summary statement would be, if the legislature were called on to be a decision maker at this point, both the Senate and House represented here feel it would be a very, very close vote. I think that's a significant, uh, I think that's a significant observation. Anybody argue with that? Okay. Here's something else that, uh, and we're getting close to 12 o'clock. I was on this committee last year, Les. Why, under the minimum foundation, does the amount the district receive in state aid education vary from year to year. A lot of people have asked me that. I'd rather have you answer it. Why, if we have a minimum foundation program, which means we get state tax monies to help fund our school districts, why does that amount vary from year to year? You can answer that, Les, I'm sure. Well, I don't know if I can or not, because there are many reasons it could vary. The reason that it varied uh, uh, most in Sioux Falls, which is where all the static was created this year, and I'm sure that 
That isn't the concern of whoever is here now, but the reason there was declining enrollment. A combination of declining enrollment, of uh, uh, changes in the local tax structure, and uh, assessment procedures could all have an effect on the amount of funding you get. I think the most unfair part of the minimum foundation formula as it now stands is that a district's ability to pay is measured entirely based on real estate, as I said. Uh, somehow that isn't uh, the fact that you have a lot of land and it's valued under the sales ratio at a high level. We all know that having to do with agriculture, that doesn't represent your ability to pay. And when you plug in a uh, uh, income formula, and there aren't even figures available, or I think there'll be tomorrow, but there haven't been figures available that show uh, what the income is per school district in the state. Uh, what is the average income of a certain school district? When those are plugged in, it looks altogether different, and your, uh, uh, the availability of funding to you could be considerably different uh, if you weren't a rich district because of a low income level. I think to wind this up, because we're up against 12 o'clock, there are several questions here on uh, the tax question, certainly a major question before this uh, convention, and it always is, and uh, you're very consistent, I think, uh, in your view. It says here, uh, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, I think it's more an observation. The Argus Leader, that's Sioux Falls newspaper, of course, led the way in stopping the income tax during the last session. What can we do, I'm pretty sure they're talking about what can the Farmers Union do, to overcome this in the next session? Andy, uh, do you agree with the observation, and uh, do you have a solution? I don't have, uh, I do have some uh, solution. Right into the mic, please. Uh, and that, that is, uh, I think more public relations uh, would have something to do with this, and to uh, tell our story uh, the way the Argus leader did. Perhaps we don't have the money uh, to do it, and we don't, we probably wouldn't lean on the same people that the Argus de uh, leader did. They leaned on the laboring people, you know. They weren't interested in labor as far as I was concerned. They were interested in the Argus leader. Anybody else in the panel want to comment uh, on that? Since it's a general tax question, uh, what can we do? The Farmers Union, I'm sure that means. Or individual farmers, or individual, not farmers necessarily, but individual people that believe in the concept of an income tax. What can you, over what can you do to overcome the resistance? to it. Probably this isn't an exact answer, well, but I, I do have an observation. I think some of the people that have been so opposed to an income tax, uh, mainly in some of the larger cities, that uh, they should be a little realistic that uh, someday we may pass a income tax that they don't care about whatsoever. Maybe for a change we ought to have a little input from them as far as the tax program is concerned because we know we have a tax problem and uh, there's a certain amount of people that have been trying to do something about it for a great many years and there's an, another group of people that are just negative all the time and that's the thing I'd like to have a little input from their side. That's not Any other thing. comments before we wind it up, Bob? Yes, I believe it's also interesting to know that the Argus leader is also corporation that I think they're being pushed by someone higher than the Argus leader. But I agree that I think we're going to have to have support out in Pierre, just like they put support out there last year on their own legislators. Their legislators from Sioux Falls last year had telegrams and letters by the hundreds in there. And I believe if we could come back on the other side and support and get support like they had, we might have a chance of getting some tax reform. Well, we hope that this has been helpful uh, to you. Uh, if you want to applaud these gentlemen for working so hard, uh, I think you get a, a fairly firm consensus on issues uh, from those men that represent, are representing the legislature, uh, really representing themselves as members of the legislature here today. And it's a complex business, an exciting one, and I don't think that there, I, I think that every person that I've ever met that's in the legislature, although I don't agree with them some of the time, come there with an idea that they're committed to do what, in their frame of reference, is the right thing to do. So what is right to one may not seem right to the other. And I think that the consensus that we're trying to build, we try to do in the name of the people, honestly. Thank you very much.